Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Spirituality Adventures. We're glad you're joining us for this episode. And today I have Mike Morell. And Mike is an author, a creative, a mystic. Um, I actually ran across Mike first time, oh, three years ago or more, maybe the first time I read Richard Rohr's book, The Divine Dance. And one of the things I noticed is that he was, it was co-authored by Mike Morell. So those of you who are watching on, uh, our uh video our youtube you can you see strain really hard and see the fine print mike morell <laughs> this book has been endorsed by uh paul young on the shack and bono and i mean every other kind of person that i really have learned to love these days and uh so i thought gosh and i was hunting around on twitter and I found Mike on Twitter and I sent him a direct message and actually he responded and he's got, I don't know how many thousands of Twitter followers you have. So I was really shocked that you, you responded. And then I've been hunting you down ever since. Right. So I've been trying to do this after that early promising indication of response, <laughs> Mike's ADHD kicked in. <laughs> but you know, what was funny is uh, Brian McLaren had challenged me to go to the wild goose festival last year for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I went and I was uh, riding a golf court up to the uh, main area after parking. And this guy in the golf cart says, are you Fred Heron? And I said, yeah, <laughs> you know, and I was like, it was a guy that used to go to my vineyard church in Kansas city named Josh Burton. Yeah. Do you know, Josh? I do know Josh. Yeah, yeah. very well. We, we lived in Raleigh together for years and went to church together there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Josh, so anyway, we connected because he had been a while. He hadn't heard my journey and my whole crazy story. And um, and then I hadn't caught up with him and his wife. And so anyway, we had some great time together there. And then I said, well, I'd really like to meet my I was hoping to meet you there. And then he he gave me your cell phone. So. <laughs> You know, so you can blame you gotta, Josh if you, you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, welcome to Spirituality Adventures. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Absolutely. It's really great to be here. Fred. I appreciate it. Let, I like to get just a little bit of origin story for people who don't know you and uh, tell us kind of like where you were born, where you grew up. Give us a little bit of your family of origin and particularly as it relates to your spiritual journey. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I grew up in the uh, the God-haunted, Christ-obsessed American South. And, uh, you know, I'm a, a product of the very tail end of 1979. So kind of growing up in the, the 80s and 90s and coming of age in that, in that soup uh, of my parents' own spiritual journey. You know, my mom praying to have a, a born-again experience after watching The 700 Club on television with Pat Robertson. And, you know, doing it night after night, saying the sinner's prayer a few times in a row to make sure that it really stuck, you know? So from an early age, yeah, kind of was in, involved in a lot of churches and a lot of what you might call a, a fundamentalist fervor that I think makes a lot of sense in, in my parents' backgrounds, having kind of disruptive home lives, that they really appreciated the certainty of the, the iteration of Christianity that they came to that said, hey, God has given us the answers to live and we have them and we can give them to you too. And so, yeah, you know, I had my own born again experience at age four saying that oh, wow. same sinner's prayer, <laughs> repenting for my life of waste. You've done so many bad things by the age of four. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah, yeah, you have like no it. idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so it was, um, you know, I think my dad grew up nominally Methodist. My mom grew up nominally Catholic, but, you know, they found their groove in the Southern Baptist Church. 
until that began to be stale for them in some ways. And um, meeting a couple who owned a bookstore in, uh, in our town of Douglasville, one night they prayed at their table knowing something was different about them and, and received a, a baptism in the Holy Spirit experience that for them enabled them to quit 20 plus year smoking habits, cold turkey. They never looked back, never stopped, wow. you know, picked up another cigarette. So suddenly we were Pentecostals and, uh, you know, we, we were going to a bona fide independent holy roller church with tambourines and dancing in the aisles. And so that's a culture shock, but uh, way more fun than Baptist church. So <laughs> I, I was down with it. And, uh, you know, sure enough, following my parents' footsteps, had my own baptism in the Holy Spirit experience shortly after that at age nine. And uh, yeah, then there were some scandals involved in that congregation. And, you know, my parents got a bit turned off. We started going to an Assemblies of God church that was a little bit more buttoned down, but still had that uh, Holy Ghost fire in some ways. And uh, yeah, so it was kind of, kind of meandering through that journey. But my parents eventually got disillusioned of that church too. And more or less stopped going to like regular congregations. And so by high school, I was a little more on my own. I was homeschooled also for seven years during the midst of all this, because my mom was just such a such a high achiever and wanting to do what was right and protect me from the evils of a secular education. And so, yeah, but by the time, you know, high school age rolled around, I was hanging out with uh, this group of conservative Presbyterians, but they had like a big theater emphasis, a big arts emphasis. And so mm -hmm. they would like write their own musicals during these summer camps of the arts. And, um, you know, the, uh, the boys and girls even had desegregated youth group and could talk to each other, unlike what the homeschooled contingent of my AG church wanted to uh, implement. So felt like a breath of fresh air uh, comparatively. I, I begged my mom after the second camp of the arts uh, one summer to let me go back to school in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, finally she relented. I think she was tired of, of fighting with me because if I had been, um, if I had been unschooled as opposed to homeschooled, you know, there's this whole unschooling phenomenon now where you, you kind of innovate the curriculum with your children, you let them follow their bliss and kind of learn what they want to learn. That probably would have been more suited to my disposition because I would end up like on the one hand reading the encyclopedia for fun and uh, reading like entire science fiction novel cycles because I was so interested in like particularly Isaac Asimov and all of this stuff around robotics. And, you know, he packed a lot of actual science into his storytelling. But on the other hand, I would be like years behind on some subjects in my official curriculum. Uh, so, you know, finally, finally got to go back to, uh, to public school and um, yeah, so just kind of growing up as that denominational mutt and seeing all these different backgrounds gave me a, both an appreciation for where I came from, but also a certain relativity because my friends who grew up Southern Baptist and were only Southern Baptist or who grew up Pentecostal and were only Pentecostal or who grew up Presbyterian and were only Presbyterian, they thought they had the corner market on reality. They thought that, you know, God handed uh, stuff down to them and that they were the unique and special chosen because of the emphases that they had. Mm. And I just kind of saw behind the curtain by the time I was a teenager and like, yeah, y'all all think this. Yeah. You can't all be right. Exactly. It doesn't mean that you're all, all wrong either, but you know, there's a little yeah. bit of a hubris problem going on here. Yeah. So, they you finally know. got it right after 2000 years after Jesus, they finally, yeah, 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 exactly. They finally nailed it. They got uh -huh, it. Uh -huh, exactly. <laughs> so, oh, man. yeah, I mean, you know, relative to my current journey, I think two things happened that were impactful, maybe three. One is um, in this Presbyterian church one day, I was, I was like a volunteer worship leader, even though I didn't play an instrument and could barely carry a tune in the bucket, but Presbyterians had way lower standards than Pentecostals for musical excellence. Uh, and so I was like helping prep for a service and I was just sitting down uh, in one of the chairs and I popped open my Bible to John 17 and read it for the first time. And John 17 is this, I think it's in, you know, typically called like the great high priestly prayer but it's this very mystical prayer by Jesus about 
divine and human interpenetration about the sort of indwelling of the father and him and his indwelling and the father and then how they are indwelling Jesus followers and Jesus followers are indwelling them. And it's not just them, but all the followers who are to come and succeeding generations are just going to be dwelling in the love and the presence of God where you kind of don't know where, where one ends and the other begins. And it's just Hmm. like, I've never heard this preached before in all of my years of sitting in church now. And Mm -hmm. it was just this like revelation. It was like, what, what is this? Mm -hmm. And and Jesus is praying it. Presumably it's, you know, true. How do we experience this? And it was an open question that after I finished high school and as I was entering college, I started hanging out uh, because of a cook in my summer job restaurant where I was a dishwasher discovered this house church that was practically in my backyard. And in this house church, it was very different than any kind of congregation I'd ever been a part of because they all took responsibility for the direction of the church. There were no paid clergy. Um, The gatherings were open and participatory, and they were really into Christian mystics, which I hadn't really even heard of before that. I didn't know there was such a thing as a Christian mystic. It sounded like one of those quote unquote new age things that my mom was so scared about. But when I discovered Brother Lawrence and uh, Jean Guillon and Francois Fenelon and Michael Molinos, who were four favorites of this particular small but global house church movement that I gradually became a part of, I discovered that they attempted to really lean into that john 17 kind Mm. of description and and descriptions that i began to find all over my bible that i didn't previously know that oh we can have like a firsthand experience with god not only a sort of ecstatic out of body experience as was you know promoted and experienced in the pentecostal world but even that sort of still and quiet space of spending Mm. time with God in my innermost being and spending time with recognizing the divine presence in others. And so that kicked off a decade with this house church movement where it really leaned into that and also began reading outside of those four mystics. And, you know, that plus the the advent of the internet and its ability to connect weirdos from all over the country and all over the planet really changed my life forever. Yeah. Wow. So you went to college at uh, Barry College. Yes. Uh-huh. In, where's that located? Barry College is in Rome, Georgia, which is uh, and, sort of North Georgia area, mm-hmm. and it's and, uh, one of the world's largest college campuses. Even though there are only about two thousand students there, and you did creative writing there, and yeah, I majored in journalism that. and I minored in creative writing and religion. Which you okay. know, some of my atheist friends will say those two are the same thing. <laughs> Yeah. And then I remember you told me your wife um, had been involved in the vineyard at one point. Yeah. You met your wife at where at college or after, after college? No, before we we met in high school, we met at the Presbyterian uh, church youth group. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, Jasmine, you know, had a background in the vineyard first in, in Virginia where she grew up. And then when they moved to Georgia, so yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of rolled deep in, in your background. And mm-hmm. as I was saying before we started recording, I was very, you know, sort of secondhand influenced by the vineyard vis-a-vis the Brownsville revival, which swept through the assemblies of God. And I still kept in touch with my AG friends, even after moving on to the Presbyterian church. And so loved that sort of early nineties uh, vineyard worship, which in a lot of ways kind of harkens to that uh, devotional and erotic stream that is present in, in mysticism and Christian mysticism through the years, arguably starting with Bernard of Clairvaux and his commentary on the song of songs, where you start, you know, seeing this uh, idea of viscerally entering into the bridal chamber. It's a, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, cross-gender role play, frankly, and it's amazing <laughs> that so many evangelicals do sing love songs to Jesus, even though, uh, you know, it often gets maligned as people yeah. begin to deconstruct their faith. But, uh, right. you know, it, it's fine for heaven to meet earth with a sloppy wet kiss, if that's what you I was doing. just going there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny is we were doing that song uh, before I went to rehab at, at my church and we did the wet sloppy kiss line, you know, mm-hmm. but everybody had all, had only heard it on the Christian radio where they changed it because the Christian radio stations across America didn't want wet sloppy kiss. 
<laughs> oh, really? I didn't even know that because yeah, I was yeah. listening so, to Christian radio by then. What did they change yeah, it to? I wasn't either, but they said, what was it? A, do you remember, Matt, what they changed it to? Oh, I forgot. They changed that line and huh. just play it on all the Christian radio stations around America. <laughs> wow. Okay. So we would have people come up to us and say, that's not how the song goes. And of course, that's how it was originally written. And, yep. and You're the, like, I've got and, the album right here. Yeah, and the author changed it just to let it be played on Christian radio. <laughs> that's crazy, you know? Yep. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It really is. And as an aside, like I've gotten to know so many CCM musicians over the years and, you know, some of them probably don't want to be named publicly, but some of them, you know, everybody knows about people like Jennifer Knapp or Derek Webb, who I grew yeah. up listening to and who have become friends because they're, you know, on this journey of just sort of, you know, deconstructing their faith and 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 reformulating something that feels healthier and, and more vibrant. It's just like, so many of us are on a journey and, you know, so many others are afraid of that journey, but it's kind of like, come on in the water's fine. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, I used to say belly up to the bar, but you know, I've been in recovery now for a few years and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that was a popular uh, now it's an slogan bar. In the early 90s, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, that Holy ghost bartender. Stuff. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about the divine dance a little bit. How, how did you meet Richard? And how did you end up um, co-authoring The Divine Dance, which, by the way, I'm going to plug it again. Uh, <laughs> it is my favorite book on the Trinity that I've ever read. And wow. um, I, I've got a lot of degrees, Mike. I've got <laughs> bachelor's, master's, uh, doctor, and almost home had a second uh, doctorate before I went to rehab and, and PhD wow. in the Hebrew Bible. Wow. So um, you're a pretty smart guy. Fred. So I've read a lot and, uh, and this is my favorite Trinity book. Um, wow. Definitely. Wow. So I'm honored. Great job. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. Thank Love you. it. But yeah, tell us a little bit about the backstory. How did you get involved in that writing project with Richard? Yeah. To tell that backstory, I'll briefly connect a little bit of the backstory that I started telling you before, you know, in college, major in journalism, minor in creative writing and religion, originally thought I would be a, uh, you know, roving newspaper journalist, but uh, print journalism was was starting to die or go through massive changes, even then in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I just realized that I wouldn't be able to start and support a family on a starting journalist salary. And so... You know, I did some soul searching and decided that I needed to uh, go to the dark side of PR if I was going to make any money, but then uh, decided that, hey, I, if I do that, I don't want to sell my soul. I would like to, you know, publicize stuff I believe in. And so I, I kind of made up a career for myself in publishing and in, um, you know, working with what became known at the time as the emerging church conversation. And so, you know, long story short, in college with my college roommate, I created this website called Sites Unseen. And at its height, it was a directory of over 10,000 websites that networked together various alternative Christian uh, phenomenon, be those websites, blogs, forums, uh, churches, intentional communities, et cetera. And I had them all categorized, but they were all like one giant page. Originally it was a GeoCities page, if you remember GeoCities. And so um, that site brought me connections with people all over the world, brought me some notoriety. I got profiled in the Atlanta Journal Constitution. They called me the, the tie that binds the emergent church. Uh, you know, I tried not to let that one get to my head, <laughs> 24 year old, but uh yeah. And so within all that, I ended up connecting with a West Coast emerging church uh, network called The Ooze. Mm. And theooze.com was a big I, site at the time. I remember, remember it. Yeah. 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 And it was, you know, before blogs were really a thing, it was a place where people ranging from, you know, Brian McLaren and Nadia Bowles Weber all the way to Mark Driscoll before he differentiated himself could just like upload articles on what they were thinking about, about the intersection of post-modernity and Christianity. And, and before social media was really a thing, the ooze had really active message boards and stuff like that where people mm -hmm. could just, you know, talk and converse. And so uh, the ooze would host a gathering called Solarize. And Solarize was one of the first places, if not the first place, to bring Richard into a uh, post-evangelical audience. 
Uh-huh. Because um, the Ooze and Solar Eyes' founder, Spencer Burke, was uh, really big into various Catholic mystics. He was a big fan of Thomas Merton, is a big fan of you know Thomas Keating and, and of Richard. And so Richard first got brought around before I was involved with Solar Eyes. I want to say in 98, the very first Solar Eyes that happened. And um, but, you know, he continued to be involved in, you know, some of the things Spencer was doing. And in 2002, I went to my first Solar Eyes in uh, Minneapolis and rocked my world in so many ways. And I ended up volunteering as an editor for the site, as well as a links editor, which was very natural for me, considering my sites unseen that I had going on. And so I, I started, you know, approving or denying, you know, requests coming in from around the world of list my congregation on your website and that kind of thing for the ooze. And it was through that that I, I did get to first meet uh, Richard through, I want to say it was uh, 2007, uh, Solar Eyes in the Bahamas, mm. and out in the Bahamas, suffering for the Lord, you know, <laughs> and um yeah, and and Richard actually was the very first person who typed me on the Enneagram during that conference because there actually weren't a ton of people who showed up. A lot of uh, congregations were stingy with their budgets and said, no, we were not going to send our pastor to the Bahamas, even though it was price comparatively to going to Omaha or something. Right. Uh, so, you know, there was only about 100 people there. And so we, we all got a lot of time with with Richard, with N.T. Wright was also there. Brennan Manning was also there. Oh, it was nice. such an amazing yeah. uh, group of, of people. Um, cool. This woman, Rita Brock. But yeah, so I got to know Richard through helping with event coordination with Solar Eyes. And, and just as an aside, I want to put in a plug. Solar Eyes had been gone for the better part of like a dozen or more years, but it's actually coming back. There's a new Solar Eyes that's going to be happening in uh, late May. So since I know this is airing soon, just want to say that if you go to solarize.org, it'll be happening on the West Coast. It's going to, there's no celebrity speakers or even presentations. It's a very collaborative bottom up gathering this year. And so, hmm. you know, it won't take any more time to talk about it now, but I'm going to try to actually make it out there. It's, it looks to be a really special gathering. So it's, it's cool how some of these things come around, come yeah. back around. But, um, but then I helped start this thing called, as we were talking about earlier, the Wild Goose Festival. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being part of the, the founding of the Wild Goose Festival, myself and Gareth Higgins and a woman named Laurel and a guy named Jacob, we put yeah. it together. And Richard was a very strong early supporter and was out at our first couple of Wild Goose Festivals. What year did that start? 2011. Okay. As I told yeah. you, I went last year for the first time. Um, yeah. Brian McLaren had encouraged me to go and yeah. uh, sounds like he dared you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Double dog dare you. Come yeah. On. Right. But since then, so some of my listeners have listened to a, quite a few interviews with people that I've met there. Um, Stan Mitchell probably be one of them that you would know well. Yeah. Um, but I could name a bunch of others, but Oh, I even did Frank, Frank Schaefer and I connected even though he wasn't there. We connected through another yeah. friend. And, uh, yeah, Frank is such a uh, goose presence. Uh, like like Richard, he's been a big supporter. From yeah. The yeah. But yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But, so how, so when that was 2011, mm-hmm. and that was kind of, uh, it, that was when the emergent movement was still kind of, would, would have been the tail end of that or the early or the latter part of that. And then, yeah, I mean, you know, we can, I don't know. We can, we can parse it different ways. You know, some, some would say that the emerging church died by like the early 2010s. Some would say that it achieved its ultimate victory and, you know, began to super influence mainline congregations mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and morphed into an even more diffuse movement known as progressive Christianity and certainly Wild Goose, you know, has become the cornerstone gathering of that kind of space. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my quick and dirty sociological take on that is that, you know, the, the golden era of, of emerging church conversation was late 90s through about 2004. So I want to say like 97 through 2004 was basically a conversation uh, of the people who were asking the questions for the people who were asking the questions. And then in 2004, a Christianity Today cover story came out called The Emergent Mystique. And it was, you know, largely a criticism. And then it began drawing the attention of um, evangelical scholars like D.A. Carson and others. And, you know, the young, restless and reformed movement of the time, the neo-Calvinist bros. And at that point, 
suddenly we weren't just able to have our own conversation. You know, it's kind of like what happens with terminology, like what happened with the term woke, how woke was originally a term within the black community to talk about being vigilant, being awake to injustice. But then when right wingers got a hold of it, it became a slur. Similarly, back in the early to mid 2000s, emergent became a slur for everything we don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at that time, evangelical media still had, you know, some sway. I would say that now, while it's still quite loud, it's in its last gasps of relevance and really beyond relevance in, in so many ways. But at the time, um, we could no longer really have the conversations we wanted without having to defend every syllable we uttered. And that just really changed the contour of, of everything. Yeah. But I'd say by the early 2010s, uh, evangelicals got a little tired of fighting with us, at least for a while. And, um, you know, the, the movement began to morph and differentiate itself and go into mainline, you know, denominations like Episcopals, Disciples of Christ, uh, UCC, et cetera, where this wasn't controversial, uh, where they appreciated the infusion of new life, even though it was challenging for them in some ways, how our us post-evangelical emergence were also wanting to rethink not just beliefs, but praxis, mm -hmm. you know, rethink how church is done, you know, sort of yeah. aesthetically and organizationally, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, that was an interesting hinge point. You're right. Like wild goose. Uh, I think you could say is the outgrowth of, of mm -hmm. a lot of those early conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, I had a, I've, I've interviewed Doug Paget. We we've came, he was coming through Kansas city a couple, few months ago and, I said, well, come, come hang out with me, you know? So we, we awesome. stayed with me and, um, we kind of, we had a little bit of conversation around that too. Um, kind of interesting perspective. I, te I tease him because when he was starting that leadership network thing, mm -hmm. um, he made the cutoff age you had to be born 1964 or, you know, or after, and I was born oh. 61. Ah. And I, I was like, Doug, you, you could have saved me from this, crash and burn that I went through. Maybe <laughs> you to let me in. I tried to yeah. get it. In. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you could have, you could have joined, you know, the Terra Nova project became exactly. young leaders became a virgin village back in the day. Could have been a exactly. exactly. Anyway, yeah. I was just, yeah. too, so I, I but, was, I was on the other end of the spectrum, very young when all that stuff was happening. I was often the youngest guy in the room at places like solar eyes or the emergent YS conventions mm -hmm. that happened in Nashville but I was interested in the conversation and, um, and yeah, through that sort of event planning hat I wore, that's how I got to know Richard. And then through my publishing hat, you know, I have this network called speakeasy and we do um, book launches for, for authors and publishers and contemplative and progressive Christianity as well as interfaith titles. And so I've gotten to work with hundreds of amazing authors and really great publishing houses over the last like 16 years or so. And, and one of those um, publishers, a dear friend of mine, Don Milam, and Don also has a background in the charismatic movement. In fact, he was uh, one of, like the vice president of Destiny Image Publishing for many oh, yeah. years. Mm -hmm. And to this day works with Whitaker House, which is a charismatic publisher. Yeah. And so- um, Interesting. But, yeah, but I always knew Don from even from my Barry College days to be more, way more widely read than that. He was very into St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and, uh, you know, various Jewish thinkers and Christian mystics, um, as well as Robert Farrar Capon, who, you know, just brilliant writer on yeah, no scandalous Capen. grace. I don't know him personally, but I've read his book. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. yeah Brennan probably. Manning liked Capon a lot, I think, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. His book on the parables is, is fantastic and thought mm -hmm. between noon and three is excellent. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I always knew Don to be more widely read than what he tended to publish. Mm -hmm. But um, a number of years ago, when his beloved wife, Mickey, passed away from cancer, um, he was really impacted by Richard's book, Falling Upward. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, sort of yeah. looking at sort of a second half of life, mm -hmm. spirituality, was really moved by it. And, and he's like, you know, Mike, I'd love to publish Richard. Can you, you know, make some kind of an introduction? And I said, yeah, I said, publishing Richard would be a fantastic idea, Don. And honestly, I have a book I would like to uh, write of Richard's. I said, you know, he, uh, at, the, at the time, um, another contemplative teacher that kind of swims in the same circles with Richard, Cynthia Bourgeau, 
had published a book called The Holy Trinity and the Law of Three. And uh, so, I, so I have her name written down here on my on my things I wanted to talk to you about ah, on my dance because, well, as I told you, I was reading your footnotes mm-hmm. and that one stuck out to me about the, the difference between two dualism, binary and three. Yes. The whole thing. And yeah. then you also referenced in the footnote, this, uh, I, I don't know how to say his name, that GI Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff. How do you yeah. say it? Um, b- different people pronounce it differently. You can pronounce it um, Gurjif, Gurjif, or if you want to be like more authentic to the sort of Armenian Turkish pronunciation, it's more like Gurjif. Yeah, but so, that footnote with those two authors really intrigued me in that whole concept. So you finish your story about the the, yeah. the come 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 full circle with the beginning yes. of uh, writing the book, and then I, I kind of want to dive into that. Yeah, no, that's, awesome. that's, that's great stuff to drill down into. You're yeah. very astute. Um, yeah, so so I knew because at that point I was like a Richard Rohr audio junkie. Like I always preferred listening to him than reading him. And so, you know, it's the Center for Action and Contemplation, li- you know, released a lot of different recordings of different conferences he had done. And so he did um, a pair of conferences, gosh, at this point, well over a decade ago, called uh, The Shape of God, and then one called The Divine Dance. And at the Shape of God conference, that was the first time that Richard and Cynthia had met each other. And her material from that conference became the core of the Holy Trinity and the Law of Three, her Trinity book. And, you know, with what became Speakeasy, my most successful book I've ever promoted, hands down, for the rest of my life will probably be The Shack. Uh, I was a part of the early launch team for the shack. And weirdly enough, I'm a back cover endorser on the book. So I'm sandwiched between Michael W. Smith and Winona Judd for some unknown reason. <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> so it's like my explain. name is on the back of, of 26 million <laughs> printed pieces of paper. That's, That's awesome. crazy. Um, awesome. And I was very influenced by Paul's vision of the Trinity and his very relational and parabolic telling of yeah. that, that inner relationship. I love indelibly that. marked. Yeah. My, my spiritual journey. And so um, I saw that resonance in Richard's material from the shape of God and divine dance conferences. And it was sort of like, well, Cynthia has a Trinity book now, which I also quite enjoy. It's like Richard should have a Trinity book. Mm. And at the time, I thought that Richard regularly used ghostwriters because, um, you know, there would be a conference one year that the CAC would hold, Breathing Underwater, for instance, and the next year a book would come out by the same title. And usually in the publishing world, that's a tell that an author is working with ghostwriters who take the transcripts from their conferences and work them into written form. So I didn't think I was like, you know, asking anything too outrageous when I approached Richard and said, hey, you know, I have a friend. He would like to publish you. Uh, I know you have no shortage of publishing opportunities, but I would actually love to um, ghostwrite a book for you based on your Trinity material. And what Richard told me was that he actually doesn't normally use ghostwriters because he's incredibly picky, but he did it once years ago and, and wasn't really that into it. But then he was like, but, you know. I like you, Mike, Um, give me a few sample chapters and we'll see. So with that, we were off to the races. Uh, Whitaker House commissioned me to do a few spec sample chapters and Richard liked them and greenlit the project. And Hmm. so then we began uh, a very collaborative process back and forth. First, me creating an entire manuscript from the raw transcripts um, while taking liberties, freely interjecting my own Trinitarian experiences and studies into the material because I knew Richard was going to look at it afterward and he could take out anything that he didn't like and didn't, you know, resonate Mm -hmm. with him. But I was really grateful that not only did it resonate with him, but he was like, you know, Michael, you added a lot of original material to this. Like, I don't want you to just be an anonymous ghostwriter. I want you to be, you know, get co-author byline credit. And, um, 
the publishers were like, yeah, that's cool, Richard, but you know, nobody really knows Mike. So I got the, the width uh, at the bottom. Yeah. And uh, you know, it was the compromise, which is fine. I understand where they were going from, but uh, yeah, but I was just grateful to be able to work with them on the project and, and that, yeah, I was able to, you know, not only I hope re- faithfully reflect his own vibrant Trinitarian spirituality, but I was able to bring a little bit of mind to the table. As yeah. Well. That's cool. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So, so dive in. I God, there's so many things I, I could, I could show you all my highlights on this book and then <laughs> could have an hour conversation on every one of them. But um, I, yeah, the, I loved the, uh, the intro that you guys did with um you know, the Russian Rublev and the, uh, the famous mm-hmm. icon. Yes. It's gorgeous. Let's, let's don't, but I kind of this, the difference between two and three and, mm-hmm. and your reference to Cynthia and Gerdorf, or however you say his name. <laughs> and Gerdorf, yeah. Gerdorf. Yeah. 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 Talk yeah. about so, that a bit. Cause I found that to be fascinating. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. As it so, relates to reality, right? It does. A lot of our, a lot of our um, Western civilization and Western philosophy is underpinned by, you know, kind of a a Cartesian dualism and also a Hegelian dialectic. And those are, you know, fancy words that just basically mean like, you know, we take the idea that that everything in life is there's, you know, this thesis and then there's an antithesis and then they're in conflict with each other. And then there's, you know, maybe some kind of new synthesis that's born that's like an amalgamation of those two. And whichever one wins, whichever one comes out on top, uh, carries the dominant theme of the day into what's next. And that would be a sort of um, a binary metaphysic. And what um, what Gershiv gets at with something he calls the cosmic law of three is that, and it, it, Cynthia names it, a ternary metaphysic, uh, a trian metaphysic. And, and the idea behind the law of three, and I should pause here and say I'm barely qualified to speak on the law of three. It, it's a very deep concept, and there are people who work with it their entire lives. So take this as a very quick and dirty sketch. But the idea is that, in fact, there are three constitutive forces in reality when we're making life decisions, when we're talking about big social movements, when we're talking about just about anything, that there is a um, affirming force, there's a denying force, which on first blush can sound similar to a Hegelian dialectic, but then there is a, a reconciling force that is not a synthesis of those two, but it's a, a yet a third motion, what some might call grace, mm-hmm. and that those three uh, interact in unique ways and then create a fourth um, phenomenon on a new plane of arising. Mm. And when you when you add that that third force in, um, that that reconciling force, it does a few things. For one, affirming and denying are not identical with positive and negative. So affirming force could be someone declaring war and advancing a war, but they're in the affirming position of that metaphysical turn because they're the ones, you know, advancing something. So it could be a a negative thing that's being advanced. Denying force could be someone resisting that war and saying, no, you know, it doesn't go any further than right here. But then reconciling force could be yet another group of people who might recognize the essential humanity of of both of these other forces and bring people to the table in a a unique way that sort of shows how to, you know, name another one of Richard's book titles, everything belongs. Mm -hmm. Uh, For me, the law of three is a way of sanctifying reality. It's a way of me um, owning whatever pole I happen to be holding in a given you know, stance, like I can recognize that I might be the affirming force in a situation or the denying force in a situation. And I can, but I can be recognizing third force or, or reconciling force when I see it and honoring all of us in the process. Mm -hmm. And so it's not abdicating the particularity of my place, which I feel like sometimes non-dual cosmologies just kind of dissolve into a soup of, oh, everything's all good, man. Um, 
that's not often how reality works. Like the the non-duality is, I think, more about seeing the hidden wholeness that underpins everything, seeing the underside where the threads come together and the tapestry, but it doesn't mean that we cease to be distinct threads. Mm. And so, you know, law of three is one way of recognizing mm. and honoring that process. And, and Gurdjieff also called the law of three, the law of universe creation, because he said, this is how uh, this is how new things are built mm. because these three forces come together, create a fourth uh, new arising, mm. not unlike how in the opening of the divine dance, um, you know, Richard introduces this uh, this idea that I have to say, you know, art historians haven't been too enthusiastic about, but the idea that there's glue on the front of Rublev's Trinity and that it used to hold a mirror there. I, I think that the spiritual truth is valid regardless of whether what may or may not be the case historically, right, yeah. <laughs> but the idea is that there's, you know, the, the, the gaze between the father, son, and spirit, as we traditionally name these three forces. And that in that gaze um, is the fourth, the hidden fourth member of the mm-hmm. Trinity, which is us, which is mm-hmm. cosmos, which is creation, which is all reality. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I think that it shows it's kind of like a water wheel in motion. It shows the the possibilities of honoring the relationality of mm-hmm. reality. And to me, that's the heart of what Trinity means. Like mm-hmm. if God is relationship in a meaningful way, and if that's how we Christians come at the sort of monotheism club in a very strange way that our Jewish and Muslim <laughs> uh, siblings in, in spirit are like, what are you talking about? Are you, yeah. are you idolaters? Right. Right. And we're like, we're like, no man, the one <laughs> out of the community. <laughs> and, and so if that's the case, Just like try the right mushroom and you'll get it. <laughs> right. You'll get it. <laughs> uh, and I think that the contemplatives <laughs> do in so many of the traditions, but it's like, um, yeah, if 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 we're if God is relationship, if God is multiplicity, but also unity because of relationship, and we claim that we are made in the Imago Day, or as I like to cheekily say, the Imago Tray, mm-hmm. then you know what is what is how do we then live? How can yeah. we uh, live our lives? And I think that that practical leaning into the law of three and seeing how everything belongs, um, including the role that I have to play. It's kind of like. The Ram Das quote, um, something to the effect of everything is perfect exactly as it is, including my desire to change it. Mm. And it's just like, that's just such a, a mm. good um, perspective for me to hold, at least. And yeah, my life. that's beautiful. And me, my, uh, you know, I always just talked unity and diversity, but I just love the way um, you, you parse that out with with all of those ideas, you know, interplaying into that really beautiful. Um, Mm. One of my friends here locally, a colleague is Paul Smith. I don't know if you ever met him or not, but uh, yeah, I I sure have. Yeah. He, uh, he was a big, he's a big Ken Wilber fan. And um, he wrote a, a book called uh, what integral Christianity or something like that, which both Wilber and Richard wrote a, you know, wrote a, I think a Ford and a yeah. word or something on it. Yeah. yeah. I love, yeah. I love Paul's work and I love uh, the integral Christian network that he founded, but yeah. he continues to bring all kinds of really cool practices to the table, including what Paul calls like we space. And, and Richard and I try to get at that too, with the exercises that are in the back of the book. I don't know if you've ever tried any of those out, but they can be pretty I, potent. I've done. In fact, this morning I do every Tuesday morning, this is a Tuesday we're talking on uh, I, at nine o'clock. I do a, a centering prayer. I'm also doing training with uh, mindfulness meditation with, mm-hmm. with Jack, as I told Jack Cornfield and Tara Brock, but then I, yeah. but the centering prayer group is a guy, there's a guy named Jack Willem who was actually on Richard's board f- with the center for action and contemplation for several years. And it's a, it's a group of, of old guys who get together. I, sorry, Jack, if you're listening to this or, or any <laughs> guys that listen to it. No, but uh, we, we do um, a centering prayer practice where we do a 20 minute sit, you know, and then read a couple of re, like, read something from just this Richard's mm-hmm. little mm-hmm. thing. And then I just reflect on that kind of stuff. But oh, that's awesome. I, I'm curious um, since we jumped on that, what, 
what do you see as the difference or is there a difference between, because I feel like I'm new to the, all of this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Sitting in contemplation or sitting in, you know, mindfulness meditation with my brain is really challenging. And, uh, <laughs> and so as I, as I've learned, it is for most everybody. Right. But, um, but yeah, I was wondering, uh, is there a difference between content contemplative prayer and what we might call mindfulness meditation. There's certainly overlap. I'm trying to figure out if there's a difference or not. Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, and I was going to ask you, even before you asked me the question, have you read any of uh, Cynthia's work? No. And I, that's, is one of those ones where I haven't got to it yet. I, you know, I'm chasing down all these books, you know, <laughs> but, you know, Ecclesiastes are into the writing of books. There is no end. And I think, man, you wrote that thousands of years ago. If you could only see today, <laughs> the mm. publishing statistics I put out there is like, I think these days, like two to 3 million books, titles a year are published in the English wow. language alone. When you count, mm-hmm. you know, ebook releases and self pub. So, you know, no shame. There's so many books out there, but if you're doing the training with cornfield and you already have a centering prayer practice, I think you would really find some good clarity or at least food for thought in a couple of Cynthia's books. Uh, One is called Centering Prayer and Inner Awakening. And her sequel to that that she released just a few years ago, I want to say is called The Heart of Centering Prayer. And so what I'm about to say in response to your question is, you know, in some ways cribbed from her, but it um, maps with my own experience. And that is that um, a lot of mindfulness meditation practices as they've come to us through transcendental meditation and you know various eastern practices are concentrative practices the idea is that we're you know maybe focusing on a point or we're focusing on clearing our mind whereas um, centering prayer as it developed from uh, influence through the english mystical classic the cloud of unknowing is a surrender practice and so um you know, some people who are proponents of mindfulness meditation actually criticize centering prayer, saying it's more of a, it's more like a, a like a drunken uh, practice because you're not trying to clear your mind, you're not trying to stop your thoughts. In fact, it's built into the process that you're assuming thoughts are going to continue coming while you're you're there on the mat, and it's more about a releasing. It's about exercising this kind of inner muscle of the mind and really of the heart. Um, where we are letting go of each thought as it comes. Mm. And, you know, Cynthia's take, and I I believe that um, Basil Pennington and Father Menninger and Thomas Keating, who sort of innovated Centering Prayer, um, endorsed this perspective, signed off on it, was that the, the goal of Centering Prayer is to become useful precisely the moment we leave our meditation kitchen. Mm. That if we... Um, practice the sort of inner muscle of the heart, continually releasing, continuing letting go into our sacred word, into the presence and love of God every time a thought of any kind comes up. Suddenly, it's easier if we're caught up, if we're cut off in traffic to feel that and let it go, it's sort of a catch and release kind of mechanism. Mm. And so it's a um, Centering prayer, I think at its best, is like a, it's a canonic practice and it's a tantric practice. And by ca- tantric, I mean um, sort of embracing the idea of, of life, of God, of love being abundantly available and supportive through kenosis, meaning that, you know, like that, that great Philippians hymn where, you know, Jesus doesn't consider equality with God something that he clung to, but instead taking the form of a servant, lets go of it, releases it. That he does that, and it's like a centering prayer emotion of release because he trusts ultimately in the provision of his divine father. He trusts that more will continue to pour through, so he doesn't have to store or collect or hold on to those energies. And mindfulness meditation, equally valid practice, but it's more of an ascetic practice. Instead of a tantric practice, it's an ascetic practice that says, we're going to accumulate these energies inside of us. We're going to store them. We're going to clear our mind. We're going to see how much we can hold inside to uh, to serve us. And so it's, you know, aesthetic and tantric are two different spiritual approaches, and they both have very time-honored lineages. They both have critiques of the other. But Cynthia makes the case in in that material, as well as in her book, Wisdom Jesus, also echoed by a a guy named James Rayhoe in a book called Tantric Jesus, 
that Jesus is more of a tantric teacher. He wasn't into fasting. He was into feasting. He was into living it up in the, the sort of lushness of life and lushness of the world. And then outpoured from that, he always thought his cup would be full, filled mm-hmm. again. So yeah. in his healing ministry, in his meal sharing, it wasn't ascetic. It wasn't conserving. It was pouring out, pouring out, but not in a way that left him dry because he always knew how to draw again from that well. And I think, and ideally that that's something that um, Center in Prayer can do. It's, you know, like every practice, uh, spiritually speaking, I think there's a sweet spot between figuring out what works for our disposition as well as what might stretch us at least a little bit, but not beyond the breaking point. So some people, you know, can actually get into the contemplative zone a lot better through using rosary or other more kinesthetic uh, praying methods. And, you know, the the ancient mystics before centering prayer was sort of reified out of it would say that there were various practices like Lectio Divina, divine reading or rosary that brought us up to the precipice of contemplatio of the contemplative stage. But then from there, it's this work of grace in our hearts that allows us to like fully enter into that zone. So I think there are a lot of different ways to get there. And I hope that gets to a little bit of your question about possible distinctions. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, man, we, I, I want to honor your time because you, you, you've got a little bit of time. I could go for hours. Uh, but, um, I did, I wanted to refer people to your website, Mike Morell dot org. Yeah. Mike Morell dot org. And by the way, um, I got through most of your interview that you had, uh, there with, Dr. Dr. J, Jerome Lube. And I, thanks for doing that. That was really, because mm-hmm. I do a lot of interviews with uh, mental health, recovery, different, different things like that. And, um, and I'll, yeah. I'll bring on health professionals to talk about some of that stuff periodically. And I really mm-hmm. appreciated that. So, and it's, there's a, there's a uh, link on your website to that interview with you and, and Dr. J, I thought that was really great. Mm-hmm, thank and, you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of interesting to hear how your your journey, your spiritual journey, your contemplative practices, and your mental health have all uh, yeah kind of they all they all drive each other. Yeah. That's so where I'm at. You know? uh-huh. I really think mental health is a spiritual practice. Really, if you mm-hmm. you know, yeah, yeah, it's you know my my lifelong struggles with anxiety are part of what drew me to the contemplative path for sure. And, and Dr. Jerome is a good friend. Yeah, highly encourage anyone to seek that out. I don't know if you can put it in any kind of show notes or anything that particular interview, but um, would also love to you know offer a, a gift to your listeners. Like if you've enjoyed this conversation around the divine dance, I actually give away a bonus chapter uh, of that book on my blog. So if you go to Mike Morell, M-O-R-R-E-L-L dot O-R-G forward slash bonus chapter, um, I give away a bonus chapter where it's stuff that, you know, Whitaker House, as gracious as they were putting me on the cover, weren't going to let me include in the book, which is some of my own personal and mystical experiences around the Trinity and like what inspired me to want to be a part of this project. And so I get to share some of my own story there. And we also share the first three chapters of the book itself and some bonus practices that aren't in the regular book, ways to practice contemplative spirituality with others. I mean, there is one solo practice in there, but the, the idea is if we're in this, the Samago tray, if, if God is community, how can we do these practices with one another in a, in a you know wonderful grounded way? And so I give all that away as a download and you also get my optimistic meditations newsletter, which you can, you know, unsubscribe anytime, but, you know, continue to share those kinds of reflections. So if you're listening to this, sounds intriguing, mikemorell.org forward slash bonus chapter, it can be yours. Yeah. Great website. Uh, plus you access your blogs and I, I, I would encourage everybody to do that. I, I enjoyed the bonus chapter as well. Mm, and if, yeah. I've been practicing, um, uh, quite a few of those types of things and in, in these different settings that I'm in with both centering prayer as well as uh, mindfulness meditation. And we do some of that even with, I'm in a mindful meditation group and awesome and similar practices. So yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. I know yeah. you got to run, but thanks. I, I'm so glad after three years we connect and maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah. are you going to be at wild goose this year? 
I will be at Wild Goose this year. Right. And yeah, yeah. Last year I was back and forth for various reasons. I wasn't even on site a lot, so no, no wonder you couldn't find me. But uh, yeah, Fred, let's yeah. see if we can so uh, get together. Our paths will cross again, and maybe we can catch a, a conversation there. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, to connecting in person. Beautiful, Fred. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for tuning in to Spirituality Adventures, and uh, we will uh, connect with you next time. Take care. This concludes today's episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Remember to like, share, or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using. And then go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, and make a one-time donation, or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.